LinkedIn is the, is a long game. It is not a short game. You cannot get great benefits out of LinkedIn, in my opinion, by going in there and saying, I'm going to post consistently for a few weeks to a month or as long as it takes me to find a job and then I'm off. That type of short-term commitment to personal branding will not work and it will not last. I've been posting consistently and writing and engaging for a few years now. And it's, it's a slow snowball effect, but it has compounding effects. Welcome to Lessons in Leverage, the podcast that takes you behind the scenes of success. We'll help you unlock the secrets of leverage so you can amplify your impact in the world. Here's your host, Spencer Lowe. Welcome back to Lessons in Leverage. We have today a guest I'm really excited about, a good friend of mine, and someone that I think is really exemplifying using leverage to advance your career. Often, I think it's easy to focus on how leverage is a tool for entrepreneurship, starting a company, things like that. James is using it to advance his career faster than a lot of his peers while also doing some entrepreneurship on the side. So without any further ado, James Dayhuff, our guest today, he is a technical project manager at uh, HashiCorp. And he's a LinkedIn top voice on technical program management, as well as a writer and online entrepreneur. James, thanks for coming on the podcast. Thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be here. And you know, we, we've known each other for a little while. And uh, I think it's this podcast is, is amazing, uh, the, the concept of it. And I'm excited to contribute my experience with leverage and, and how I've seen it multiply my, my efforts. I love it, man. Thanks. So maybe for people that are listening that don't know what technical program management is, you know, you went through the IS program in uh, college, which really combines elements of like an MBA with computer science and technical skills. And as you come out of that, there's a lot of options available to you. You could probably go be an engineer. We have people that we know that we went to college with that ended up being totally on the business side, uh, com- deep in the engineering, somewhere in between. And so what, where in the landscape of like work, what is technical program management for people that are listening and interested? Yeah, that's a really good question. And so to answer your question of what is technical program management, in the context of leverage, the role of a te- technical program manager is a piece of leverage that a company would utilize to really kind of tame the chaos of large, complex initiatives. So a technical program manager really is introduced as a company's trying to mature from a small to mid-sized company. And especially when it's trying to go from maybe a, a mid-sized to a mature, larger enterprise, you need somebody there that can tame the chaos, can pull stakeholders together and leverage the impact of each of these teams to be something greater than what they could individually deliver. So really, for a company to to elevate to that next level, they need that role to upgrade the operating model to handle the increased scale and complexity. And that's really where TPMs come into the picture. And the the phrase that I I harp on when when I write and when I meet with other people aspiring to be TPMs or looking to inject that into their companies, the phrase I like to use is that they drive scaled execution of strategically important initiatives. It's kind of a mouthful, but to me, it succinctly describes the role of a technical program manager, again, to drive scaled execution of strategically important initiatives. That makes sense. So it's it's that it's handling the complexity of all the different technologies and stakeholders and and sort of bridging the gap between the business process, the technical requirements, and all of the chaos and complexity around that into creating momentum for creating progress, getting to business results, and, and really driving having the skill set to drive across both sides of that, the people and human side, the soft skill side, as well as the uh, technical depth, the engineering side, the technical challenges and constraints. Is that, do I got that right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I think you would summarize that. Well, another way to think about it is you have project management, which would focus on outputs, right? They want to get a project done on time in scope with the resources allocated. A program manager is very much focused on, How do we pull multiple projects together to get the outcomes that we want, the business outcomes that we want from these outputs that are coming from projects? 
And so moving above a singular project to several projects, maybe a portfolio of projects, and thinking about the strategic consequences is what maybe elevates someone out of a very tactical project management role and into a more strategic TPM type role. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because a single project in a program, if that was delivered in and of by itself, it may not have nearly as much value as when you combine it with seven other projects that lead to some bigger outcome, right? Mm. That, that's why that strategically important initiatives part of that definition is important because you get to that part where you're moving beyond outputs, you're moving beyond just deliverables and you're, you've moved into the realm of what are the outcomes and actual impact of what we're working on? I love that. And I think this is a perfect example of the difference between like if you're an employee somewhere and you are doing whatever your skill is, whatever your job is, but you want to make more money, you want to have more opportunity, you want to elevate yourself. Leverage is such a massive key to making more money and being more successful. And I know enough about your job to know that you're very successful. And with that in mind, uh, I think <laughs> you're a great example of someone that used leverage to advance your career faster than a lot of people we know who have been out of college for a similar amount of time, might be in other roles, might even be in roles that traditionally seem like higher earning roles, but maybe making less. Uh, you know, they might be in engineer roles or, or traditionally seen as these high earning roles, but maybe haven't progressed as fast in terms of the leverage that they can wield for a company and how that then gives you more earning power, more influence and, and, and a seat at the table from a strategic perspective. And so I think that you know, that difference between just being a great executor on, say, a project and, and project management or a great executor as just a frontline individual contributor engineer or one of these other roles, weaving that all together into something that achieves these business results, that's a combination of a few different types of leverage. I'm excited to break that down on the lever labor leverage side and how you get more out of the people and, and getting the people to do things that are, are producing larger outputs, the technological leverage, and in your case, also the media leverage, because getting a job like this is going to be competitive, is going to be more challenging. The, the higher the pay, the more the responsibility, the more strategic the role. It's not something you're just going to get by sitting in the same job and, and you know doing what you've always done. And so the fact that you have built on this big media leverage aspect of writing, getting your name out there, getting known for your expertise in this area, I know that has opened up the opportunities that you have available to you significantly compared to someone who's just heads down in their role. So I'm excited For to unpack sure. all of that. But where where would you start when you think about kind of realizing that if you wanted to advance your career faster than say normal or average, and if you wanted to get to that next level, where where did it start for you? Was it more on the labor leverage side? Was it more on the media leverage side? What were what was that first moment where you kind of realized I can play at a higher level? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I, I think that's a good place to start is just with my personal story of learning how to leverage networks, social networks to really amplify my career trajectory, right? So if you rewind a little bit in my career, uh, going through school and in my first job at Goldman Sachs and my second job at ExxonMobil, I was really focused on on having job security. That was my big focus. And I had this realization while I was at ExxonMobil in 2020 that no company can promise job security. They can try as they may to preserve it, but in the end, a company can't provide that. And so that was a, a paradigm shift in and of itself. And it shifted me to, to focus a lot more on, okay, well, what's my marketability? And I look at marketability as, as kind of two things, right? It's my ability to create value in the economy, in the job market, and the awareness that people have of my ability to do that, right? I, I can't just be able to do it and nobody knows about it. And I also just can't be out there shouting my name if I don't have the competency to back it up. So marketability to me are is those two things. So let, let's look at a contrasting example of, of when I realized that leverage was important in managing my career and building a personal brand. And really, it's a story of me learning that LinkedIn is a high leverage tool for building a personal brand. 2020, I tried to leave my job at ExxonMobil, but I found it extremely difficult. I didn't have a personal brand at the time. I only had loose connections from college. 
And it was an uphill battle to try and find a role that fit what I was looking for long term. That was a good fit for my existing skills and that would challenge me and also have the work life balance that I was I was searching for. After about a year of applying and inter- interviewing, I finally landed a job that that had that good match, but it took a full year. So fast forward to 2022 when I was laid off from Twitter after Elon Musk's acquisition of the company. From the moment I was laid off to when I accepted a job offer was 4 weeks. And in between that 4 weeks, I had been interviewing for six different companies. I was contacted by somebody on LinkedIn to write a course on technical program management, and that's on educative.io. And I currently get monthly royalties from that, so that that is a huge opportunity there. Eventually, I had three job offers. And to put this into context, the end of 2022 was in a down market for most tech roles. Right, finding a job was really hard because the market was just flooded with good talent. Unfortunately, good talent in a highly competitive market like that is not always sufficient to land a job. That comes into what I mentioned earlier about marketability. Right? How do you know what you're doing and be competent, and also help people be aware of that? So, really, how did that transition happen? It's because I was consistently writing on LinkedIn and engaging with people that were writing on similar topics. And that snowballed into massive leverage that I have now in a, in the form of a personal brand that instead of me pushing resumes out and looking for opportunities, it's like a magnet. Having a personal brand is like a magnet where opportunities come to me. And it is a, an exciting and thrilling aspect of my career that I hadn't anticipated before. But as I've leaned more into this leverage of LinkedIn, it's really been a game changer for me in, t- in terms of like how accelerated my growth has been. So really, I, I view it as, as personal branding on LinkedIn as a multiplier. It's leverage. And my single effort to write has had an amplified outcome for my whole career with one caveat. Consistency is the only way that you'll get that leverage on LinkedIn for your career. That consistency is something everyone, I think, would love to have a brand on LinkedIn and so they think, all right, I'm going to write on there for a few weeks or I'm going to write on there once a week or occasionally. If you were to lay out sort of the tactics that, that actually added up to that, to, to really having a brand on LinkedIn, what were those three to four steps that if someone that's listening, it's like, you know what, you convinced me. Having a brand on LinkedIn matters to me. What are the things that that you did and you would recommend someone do to establish a real personal brand on LinkedIn? Yeah, I, I think there's two things that I'd start with. And these are less tactical and more of a mindset shift that you have to have in mm-hmm. order to find that leverage. So the first thing is LinkedIn is, the, is a long game. It is not a short game. You cannot get great benefits out of LinkedIn, in my opinion, by going in there and saying, I'm going to post consistently for a few weeks to a month or as long as it takes me to find a job and then I'm off. That type of short-term commitment to personal branding will not work and it will not last. I've been posting consistently and writing and engaging for a few years now. And it's, it's a slow snowball effect, but it has compounding effects. What, is, what does that mean consistently? Daily? Five times a week? 20 times a week, what has what, what your, your rhythm been? When I first started, it was a few times a week. And as I saw the momentum build, I figured I should lean into it more. And that led me to research a little bit more about the LinkedIn algorithm itself to see how do, how do you game the system, right? And it turns out that really once a day is the optimal frequency to be posting there. Uh, to really gain traction, to build a network. So yeah, that, that's a good question. What does consistently mean? So I found once a day, but if that seems overwhelming, if anybody's looking to start, I would just say find a regularity that works for you and start to commit to that, right? Find an on-ramp for yourself and and start down that journey because part of it is just getting better at writing as well. So go, going back to the mindsets, right? The The first is... It's a long game. You need to be consistent. 
the second mindset shift that I think you have to have is that there's, there's enough pie for everybody. Mm. It, you can almost look at it and say, well, there's too many, you know, people on LinkedIn that are crowding the space that I'm, that I want to write about. And what you'll find if you consistently write and engage with people is that there's, there's plenty of space for everybody. If you want a personal brand, it doesn't mean that somebody else can't have a personal brand. There is plenty of space to grow and to network and, and, you know, build those relationships, which in and of themselves become leverage for opportunities in the future. So those are the two first mindset shifts I think a person needs to have to really lean into LinkedIn being leverage. All right. So you started with LinkedIn and that created this magnetism that opportunities started coming to you. And to be even more specific about what we mean by that, job offers were coming to you, ability options to write courses and get royalties from that. Are there other things that we haven't hit on yet that, that are the types of things that when you build that personal brand start changing in your life? Yeah, I, I mean, one other thing that I didn't mention that, that has come to me is I'm, I'm speaking at a conference soon um, on technical program management, and that's part of the personal branding effect, right? I've been out there. I'm vocal. I write sometimes short things, long things. Irregardless of that, I I have the opportunity to go out and continue to amplify. So it's it's almost like as you lean into it, those opportunities to amplify will continue. So that that I think is an additional, I guess, outcome you could say of sure. building that leverage. And yeah. what the, the the venture I'm on now is building out a personal newsletter. And so that's in the early stages, but it, it's already proven to be a lot more successful than I thought it would be purely because I already have an audience on LinkedIn that I'm, I'm highly engaged with, right? So converting people to a dedicated newsletter is a lot easier than trying to start one from scratch with no personal brand, right? So my ability to create products to have an online entrepreneurship experience is made a whole lot easier because I have that personal brand. So to recap some of the additional opportunities, getting invited on podcasts, getting invited to speak at conferences, getting more reach through more sources, which then compounds the already building effect of that audience mm -hmm. and drives the ability to monetize that or further build on that, whether that's through a newsletter or online products and, and the ability to, to then uh, build an online business, which again, that starts to provide more of that quote unquote safety or security where yeah. even though you're still focused on your career, you still have your full-time job, you're, you're creating these other additional alternative income streams and insulating yourself through now a combined, a combination of more job opportunities available to you at all times, a much larger and engaged network that would be able to help you find a job or make money in other ways, more income generating opportunities in terms of speaking, you know, online products, what have you. So all of that is adding up to really that goal you originally had of, I want to feel more insulated, more security. And, and today, maybe talk about how that feels compared to back in 2020 when you started your journey. What's that difference like now as all these opportunities are coming in? Is your confidence... Is it slightly better? Is it way higher? The emotional state you're in depends a lot of how you perform, right? So that emotional state you're in, tell me about the difference. Well, that, that's, that's a really insightful question. I made the massive mistake of allowing or rather trying to give that sense of job security and insulation to a company, right? I didn't, for whatever reason, I, I, I've analyzed this before, right? We could go into that kind of psychoanalyzation of why I was thinking the way I was. But the point is, I wasn't owning it. I wasn't owning my job security, my marketability. I was depending on, you know, the company I was working at and the name of that company and where it would get me and things like that. The feeling of confidence that I have now that I've built over the past three years is a higher level of confidence that I've ever felt in my life. And that to me is probably one of the most rewarding aspects of this whole thing that I've, I've engaged in with building a personal brand because I feel like I am in the driver's seat of my career and my stability. 
of course, unforeseen things happen, right? For example, I was laid off, right? But that layoff didn't deter my confidence because I had built a brand by that point. And so building that personal brand took that ownership back into my court and helped me feel like no matter what happens, I have the confidence that I can create value in the, in the economy or in the job market in a way that people want it and it's demanded for. Yeah, that's, that's an incredible way to feel. I think there's a lot of people who aspire to that and don't know how to get there, don't know. And certainly there's more than one way to get there. But I would argue the answer to that question is leverage, generally speaking. And a personal brand is one form of media leverage, audience leverage, yeah. however you want to call it, that, that certainly creates that. And the more you create that leverage in different ways, the more that you see the way that you're not beholden to life. Life's not happening to you. Life is something that is happening for you. It's something that you are a participant in and that you have actually a large degree of control over. And because you know that you can put your inputs can result in outsized outcomes, the more you see that pattern, the less you stop, the less you operate from a position of fear because there's always going to be variability. But when the highs are much larger than the lows, so the ability to earn more in shorter periods of time, to achieve more in shorter periods of time, to get results faster and and more on your own terms, seeing that happen in your life makes gives that feeling of confidence where now during a low, you know my efforts are going to result in another high. They're going to result yeah. in getting through this, getting to the other side, and they're going to result in it faster the more leverage that I have and in bigger outcomes with the more leverage I have. And so anyways, so I, yeah. I love that concept because it's, it's such a freeing feeling. And I think people look, look at a lot of these things as risky, like, Oh, what do people, what will people think about you online? What if you say the wrong thing and get canceled? What if, you know, you, you argue with someone, what if someone doesn't like you, whatever, all these dumb fears people might have about posting online or, you know, building that online brand. And those, those downs are far out wide, weighed by the emotional stability, security, et cetera, that you can get from it. But I do think there yeah. are risks on, on that side. So I would love to touch on a few of those potential pitfalls and see how you deal with it. How do you avoid not getting lost in social media? Because if you're going to be on LinkedIn every day, it's easy. And I think a lot of people, whether or not they're posting, might get lost just scrolling and scrolling and scrolling. And that's not adding any value to your life. That's not... <laughs> to develop your personal brand. So is there any tools or specific elements of your approach that help you to stay focused? There's a few different activities on building a brand on LinkedIn that work and that are going to help. There's posting, there's engaging and building real connection with people in your audience and, and, and going back and forth with them. There's engaging with certain groups, topics, et cetera. So there's like tactical things and you'll know these better than me, but there's like tactical things. And then there's scrolling around, clicking, randomly liking. <laughs> it's not going to get you anywhere. So how do you stay focused and get the most out of the time that you invest in LinkedIn, on social media, building that brand? No, oh, that's a good question. I'll, I'll be, I'll be quick to admit that sometimes I do get lost in social media, right? And occasionally that's not a bad thing. Uh, it's when it becomes like a repeated habit and pattern, right? So that definitely needs to be uh, managed carefully because being on social media can suck you in, right? And it can suck you in. And th this is the dangerous part. It can suck you into the game of comparison, which mm -hmm. can destroy confidence. It, it's like the dark side of building a personal brand on a social platform. Because then you're comparing, you're saying this person has this many followers. Oh, this person posted something and they got this many reactions. Oh, oh, this person has a, an opportunity that they shared and I, I didn't get that. So it has a dark side of, of saying, how do you consistently show up and not compare, right? Mm -hmm. I think that's the biggest dark side of, of being on social media and building a, a personal brand. And I think it goes back in my mind to that original mindset shift that I talked about where the pie is big enough for everybody, right? Once you can accept the fact that other people can win and you can also win simultaneously, a lot of that goes away. A lot of that becomes you're cheering on your, your fellow creators on social media 
and you're observing and trying to learn from them rather than comparing and letting that drag you down to feel like you're not doing enough and you need to hustle more. So I, I, I think that is definitely something to be cautious of. And it's, it's very much a mindset shift that you have to have and also managing the time that you spend on the platform. So the, this kind of leads into uh, another piece of leverage that's interesting to look at when it comes to building a personal brand and it's automation, right? I often get asked about how I balance my professional career, my efforts to build a personal brand and uh, my portfolio of digital products and having a busy family life of three kids ages five and under. Like that's a lot going on, right? And the the answer to how, how do I balance all this when it comes to the personal brands aspect specifically, automation is a high leverage tactic to make personal branding possible for anybody. I often write in bulk, right? Mm -hmm. I write for one to two hours every couple of weeks, schedule them out once a day, and suddenly you have like 14 posts that will consistently show up without you doing anything. What are those tools that those automation tools that you're using that help you do that? So I've I've jumped around to a few of them. There's definitely some that are better than others. What I'm using right now is called Simplified, and that does a lot of social media automation. It has some uh, digital media creation tools in it to make it easier as well. So that that's the one I'm on right now. There's other ones that I've used that are uh, very much. I think more streamlined and simple, but I, there, there's advanced features that I've, I've grown into the need for, but one of them is buffer. That's a really popular one that is very straightforward. It's the first one I used when I was trying to do automation and it's so simple and inexpensive that it just made a lot of sense. Typeshare is also a, a growing platform for that as well. That's more of a, a blogging platform that can be also automated to push to your social media channels. So there's that whole market of automated social media. It's, it's a very crowded market. You have plenty of options to choose from if you're looking for automation, but really what that's enabled me to do is throughout the week, I, I get onto LinkedIn before my work day spend 15, 30 minutes engaging with people, other people's content, my own content that they've commented on. So automation has allowed me to focus on the things that are should be handled one-on-one, -on -one, which is relationship building, right? Those relationships are best not to be automated <laughs> because then you get to know people personally, right? So while you rest, automation keeps my my personal brand alive and kicking. And it really maxes my, maximizes my reach while minimizing my effort that I have to put into it. I love that. You just touched on another concept that I really like to focus on, which is relationship leverage and just the value of building relationships, which can create leverage in a lot of different ways. Let's talk about challenges. Has there been anything that was a big setback or challenge as you were trying to use leverage or learning to use leverage uh, that sticks out to you? I think one of the, uh, and we, we've already touched on this a little bit, so you can decide <laughs> how much you want to, to rehash this. The biggest example that comes to mind is when I've been building my personal brand on LinkedIn, the lack of automation was a challenge. Before mm -hmm. I, I kind of leaned into that, I was looking at this journey, this this long game of, of LinkedIn and, and deciding like, I don't know if I can keep this up. Like I'm going to burn out. I can't, I can't consistently do this. So that was definitely a challenge that I had as I was trying to do something that was, that I'd never done before. So working through that challenge and discovering how to automate and kind of the, the cadence and the rhythm to that, and how automation became a point of leverage for me was a really big lift in my journey in building my personal brand. Because in, in, in today's like digital world, consistency and showing up is the currency that you exchange essentially. And so automation always ensures that you're rich with that currency. And I, I hadn't understood that at that point. And so there was a point where I was like, do I continue with this personal branding or not? I don't, 
I don't think I can do it with a family, with a job and, and show up every day. And so it, it did take a little bit of a paradigm shift for that to happen. I love it. As you look at AI, so totally reshaping, and I think will totally reshape our entire lives over the next who knows how many years. Are there any tools that you think will either disrupt technical pro- program management as a field, will disrupt some of the things you're doing, and or are there tools that you're excited about that are accelerating what you're doing that are a form of leverage that you're getting more done? Uh, you know, obviously automation is a big key, but what does what does AI bring to the table and how are you using it to get ahead? That's a really good question. I'm not going to dive into too many complex tools with AI, rather just talk about generative text-based AI like ChatGPT or Bard. I personally currently subscribe to use ChatGPT, pay the monthly premium so I can get the latest and greatest model uh, for the best <laughs> for the best amount of leverage there, right? So ChatGPT has really been like an eye opener for me. Um, it has been really, really fun to experiment with how it can create leverage in my life and do things, you know, simple input for me, but have exponential outputs. And I've used it in a wide variety of areas of my life. For example, parenting. When I put my kids to bed at night, I ask ChatGPT to create a really creative story. I ask for my kids' input. I'm like, okay, what do you want to learn about? Or what do you what should the story be about? Who should be the main characters? So I gather input from them. And I also try and inject uh, some some type of key learning, maybe a challenge that they're struggling with, like adapting to a new school, right? Something like that. And inject that type of experience or, or story-based learning. Um, and so that in and of itself has been a, a form of leverage as a father, which has been surprising. I, I didn't really expect that in terms of AI. That's an incredible example. And I'm absolutely stealing that and, and trying that out with my kids. That sounds really fun. Oh, it is. It is fun. I mean, you can go down the rabbit hole with that whole thing. And eventually I want to create some of these stories and these common characters. And I want to print some books with art generated by AI as well. So the kids have these books that we've been having, this series of stories with these characters that they've come to love and appreciate. So eventually I'll do that. But that's that's a little down the line when when (laughs) maybe next year I'll try and tackle that. So if we look at uh, personal branding, AI is heavily leveraged there for writing. And what that tends to be is sometimes editing, uh, having basically an editing partner to review content. Uh, Often I use it to say, look, here's what I've written. Help me understand a good writing framework that will engage the audience more than how I have it written today. Mm -hmm. So you could, you could look at that and say, oh, well, it's just replacing your writing. That's that's partially true, but I am learning how to write better because of it, right? As I continue writing more and more, I find myself writing better because of the things I've learned through ChatGPT. Each time I ask it to critique my writing, I say, explain to me why you changed X or Y. That's a critical mm-hmm. part of it. And so I understand that. So that that's a, a little bit of, you know, AI applicable to to writing and personal branding. And then I think if we pivot over to technical program management, you know, you mentioned, will it disrupt the job? Will it change the job? What what does it actually look like? I don't see AI completely dismantling technical program management as a function because of the many, many areas it touches today. AI could definitely evolve to that point. I think in the short term, it is more of an accelerant for performance than it is anything else. So. For example, some of the ways that I've used AI in my job as a technical program manager is to climb the learning curve in a technical domain quicker. Earlier this year, I was approached by my company to say, hey, we we need to assign you to a a major initiative involving disaster recovery, all these things. And I was like, "I, I generally, I like know what the objectives are of disaster recovery, but when it comes to the specific implementation details, I needed to ramp up a lot quicker because it's been a while since I've, I've studied that. So using 
AI, I was able to climb that learning curve and ask specific questions by saying, look, I need to know about disaster recovery. Can you tell me about it from the lens of a technical program manager? Can you tell me about it from the lens of a finance analyst in the company? Can you tell me about it from a product manager's perspective? So I was able to observe this domain from multiple angles, right? And that helped with early mis- risk management investigation um, and mitigation. Uh, essentially, an- another way, uh, a related way is, is brainstorming ways to organize massive chunks of work. Sometimes it's, it's very complicated chunks of work and, and it can be mind bending to say, how do we slice this down so it's manageable? And so proposing something to AI to say, hey, I've, I've broken it down in this way. Like, what are the pros and cons of this? What are some alternative approaches? Like that's accelerated my ability to think about how to approach problems and organizational structure. So there, there's a few other examples I can give, but yeah, it's it has been accelerant for <laughs> my role. Like I, I just, I, I can do more in less time, which is essentially what I'm looking for to, to do better with my job. So I love it. If you could go back, give young James a, just a couple recommendations or a few pieces of key advice. Maybe it's a book recommendation. Maybe it's some wise words that you have now that you've, you know, gone down this journey a ways. But if you, if you could talk to yourself, just barely graduating college and give yourself two to three pieces of advice that you think would have dramatically accelerated the results and helped you to learn to use leverage sooner, what would that advice or set of recommendations be? Um, I think the first thing that comes to mind, I would recommend to myself, have a greater bias for action to experiment with things. In, in my mind, there is a lot of a need to like kind of stay in my lane, right? And that ended up slowing me down quite a bit. So if I were to go back, I would I would tell myself, look, experiment with things, break outside your role, have a bias for action, focus on the outcomes you can generate rather than the outputs in your function that are expected of you, right? And it, it's a bit embarrassing to to say that because that is a that's a very like a mediocre way to work and that was just like my paradigm. So I'm I'm grateful that I've I've had this this paradigm shift. Uh, but yeah, that bias for action, I think to discover leverage and to, to discover where, what works and, and iterate on that um, is something that I would tell my younger self to improve on faster. Smart advice. I love it. That's uh, you, there's so much to be said for just leaning in and trying things uh, and ideally trying more things faster. Uh, you know, it, if you don't, then you spend so much time on the mental journey getting nowhere, you know, like yeah. theoretically yeah. considering things and theoretically uh, trying things. But if you just lean in, dive in, start trying within days, weeks, months, you figure out what works, what doesn't work, and you can totally see the world through a different lens. So I love that bias for action. As we sign off, what do people need to know? Where do they sign up for this conference you're speaking at? Where do they get on your newsletter? Where do they come connect with you? Any final message that you have for the audience before we, we uh, part our ways? Yeah, good question. The uh, conference is in two days. So probably by the time this is published, it'll be too <laughs> late for that. Uh, but definitely hit me up on LinkedIn. My name is just as it appears probably in this podcast, James Dayhuff. And from there, you'll find links to anything I've created. I've, I've created my LinkedIn profile as my my digital hub for everything. So you'll find my newsletter there for technical program management. It's called the TPM Craft, and it's really focused on helping people skill up in leadership skills, technical skills, um, and program management skills. So that's the focus of the newsletter. If anything like that sounds interesting, uh, check it out because there are some things coming hot off the press that are very exciting, very useful. It's been live for a few weeks now, and there are hundreds of people on the newsletter already. So it has it has picked up quicker than I expected, and and I think that's a testament to the value of the things I've been writing. 
That's awesome. We'll put James uh, LinkedIn in the show notes. James, thanks for being here. Really appreciate you, man. Yeah. Thanks, Spencer. Hey, before you go, I have a small request. Our mission is to empower as many people as possible to maximize their potential through the power of leverage. Could you help us in this mission by leaving a review on iTunes, Spotify, or YouTube? And if you know just one person who would benefit from today's episode, would you please share it with them? Your support means the world to us, and we are thrilled to have you in the community. Thank you for being a part of our journey and helping us grow. You can find show notes for today's show and past shows at LessonsInLeverage.com, which also has links to connect with me personally and connect with our various podcast channels across your favorite social networks. A big thanks to Solve.Cloud who sponsored this episode. They're a group of expert consultants that help SaaS and financial services companies to implement, optimize, and manage Salesforce.com. They can help you with custom integration solutions and are helping customers to implement some of the most important generative AI technologies. You can find them at Solve.Cloud. Solved.cloud. That's S O L V D dot cloud is the URL. Thanks again, and we'll talk soon.